I believe we're Assembly Bill 2861 by Mr. Ting. Move the bill. 2861 Ting has been moved by Quirk, seconded by the chair. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. The motion is due pass as amended with the amendment shown in the committee analysis and re refer to the Appropriations Committee. Gatto. Just fine. Aye. Gatto, aye. Patterson? Aye. Patterson, aye. Burke? 2861 Ting. Burke, aye. Chavez? Aye. Chavez, aye. Daly? Eggman? Christina Garcia? Eduardo Garcia? Okay. Okay. Hadley? Okay. Hadley, aye. Hernandez? Okay. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. Obernolte? Aye. Obernolte, aye. Quirk? Aye. Quirk, aye. Santiago? Aye. Santiago, aye. Ting? Williams? Aye. Williams, aye. Garcia, aye. Garcia, aye. Christina Garcia, aye. All right, so uh, 2861 Ting has passed. Okay, next we have, um, we need a motion and a second on Assembly Bill 1979 by Mr. Bigelow. Move the bill. Terrific. Bill's been moved and seconded. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. The motion is due pass with the amendments shown in the committee analysis and re refer to the Appropriations Committee. Gatto. Aye. Gatto, aye. Patterson. Patterson, aye. Burke. Aye. Burke, aye. Chavez. Aye. Chavez, aye. Daly. Eggman. Christina Garcia. Aye. Christina Garcia, aye. Eduardo Garcia. Hadley. Aye. Hadley, aye. Hernandez. Obernolte. Aye. Obernolte, aye. Quirk. Aye. Quirk, aye. Santiago. Aye. Santiago, aye. Ting. Williams. Williams, I. Okay, uh, that bill has also passed. And while we have members here, let's lift the call on uh, 2120 Weber. Gatto? Aye. Gatto, aye. Christina Garcia? Aye. Christina Garcia, aye. Eduardo Garcia? Hernandez? Santiago, aye. Santiago, I. Ting, Williams, aye. Williams, I. Okay, that has to go back on call. We'll put it back on call. Alrighty, so next up is me. Uh, I'm going to hand the gavel over to Mr. Quirk. Uh, that's because our vice chair is not here. And um, I will start by presenting, um, I'll start with by presenting ACA 11 while Mr. Wilk, my joint author is here. Thank you. Mr. Chair, you may begin. Thank you very much. So before you, members of the committee, is Assembly Constitutional Amendment 11, which would place before the voters an initiative to strike Article 12 of the California Constitution, thereby removing the constitutional protections enjoyed by the CPUC. It would then require the legislature to reassign uh, the functions of the CPUC by 2019, when Article 12 will sunset. In the intervening time, uh, the, those provisions would stay in place. The CPUC's status as a constitutionally protected agency has enabled it to uh, sometimes engage in picking and choosing which policies it chooses to enact and enforce. And recently, the CPUC's ability to regulate these wide-ranging and diverse industries has been called into question. Uh, I would submit to you that the tragedies in San Bruno and Porter Ranch and the distrust and um, discontent in every part of the state. You have people in um, 
northern San Diego County and southern Orange County concerned about nuclear waste. You have people in the Central Valley concerned about the oil trains that go through their communities. You have people in the Bay Area upset about San Bruno. Uh, you have uh, the residents of Mr. Wilkes District and very close to mine who missed Thanksgiving and Hanukkah and Christmas in their houses because uh, there was yet another pipeline that ruptured. Uh, you have everybody in this state concerned about how the CPUC is doing its job and wondering whether it is indeed doing its job. So what we are seeking here is to get a regulatory regime in the state that is more focused and more specialized and more, more able to deal with the things that could cause the gravest public harms. And uh, these are the things that I presented before as the things that go boom and the things that go bzzz, meaning the things that can blow up or shock you. Um, We've also had, uh, look, the, the litany of complaints has been a mile long. I don't need to go through all of them with you. Um, everything from the way that power outages are handled due to, win due to rainstorms and windstorms to some of these scandals that we as a legislature have had to deal with time and time again when it comes to the way that people communicate with this board or the things that the board does during its off hours. But this is not, uh, the point of this initiative is not to, to focus on the past and focus on the things that are wrong with the PUC. And it's not to, uh, to cast any aspersions on the people at the CPUC who mean well. There are many workers there and many commissioners who really, really do believe in their mission. Uh, but I think we do need to rethink whether, uh, whether this agency should have all of the diverse responsibilities that they currently have. And your vote on this measure comes down to really one question, and that is asking yourself, if you were uh, holding a constitutional convention at this time, if you were tasked with creating a regulatory agency in 2016, would you constitute the PUC as it is constituted? Would you give one agency powers over hot air balloons and gas pipelines, over cable companies and cell phone bills and moving companies and uh, electrical generators and water and all of the many things that the CPUC has responsibility for? Or would you give uh, different agencies authority for these things, and would you make it so that the public feels like they were actually paid attention to and that there was oversight so that we, we as a legislature could hold these agencies accountable if they screw up? Uh, we held a town hall, Mr. Wilk and I, in his district about Porter Ranch, and you should have seen the looks on the faces of the public when they came up and they said, I'm so upset that this inspection or that inspection didn't happen. And somebody got up from the state, from, from the executive branch, and said, well, it could be Dogger, could be the PUC, could be the DWP, could be uh, ARB, could be, I mean, they went through all these alphabet soup agencies. And that member of the public just knows that they were not in their house on Thanksgiving. And that their biggest asset that they've ever purchased is now worth 30, 40% less. And so it's very, very clear to me that we need, in the 21st century, we need um, much clearer, much more nimble lines of authority, um, much more clearly uh, defined, better defined regulatory responsibilities, and that we can do that by providing for consumer protection, public health, environmental protection, increased transparency, public access, and making sure that the public can participate in these very important tasks. And so with the committee's indulgence, I'd like to turn it over to my joint authors who also want to make some statements, um, and then we'll turn it over to witnesses. Thank you. I know it's been a long day, so I'll be really brief. First of all, I want to thank the chair of this committee for his outstanding work on this measure. And he's absolutely right. This agency was created under Governor Hiram Johnson when he was running on the Bull Moose Party ticket with Theodore Roosevelt in 1912. Clearly, it does not reflect um, today's regulatory environment, the things we need to do to, in a 21st century economy. And so we do need to take a hard look at this, and this bill's the first step toward that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you, committee. I, I also want to thank uh, the, the chairman and, and my joint authors on, uh, on this bill. As uh, our historian, Mr. Wilk, shared with us how, how this uh, regulatory agency came to be, it was supposed to be a check on power. It was supposed to be a body that provided accountability. It was supposed to root out and stomp out corruption. And to play on uh, the many metaphors that we can, what we have seen by a regulatory scheme frozen in time uh, has resulted in a slow moving train wreck for the state of California. 
that uh, this ACA 11 provides the opportunity to reorganize these regulatory bodies so that it has a clear focus, necessary accountability, and is structured in the way that serves the public best. I respectfully ask for an I vote uh, on ACA 11. And with us is our first witness in sport, which is Mr. Mike Aguirre from San Diego. Thank you very much. Uh, I must tell you, back in 1974, my first job when I graduated from Cal was a deputy legislative counsel. And uh, I used to look like some of the younger members back then. I don't look like that anymore. But for the last seven years, I have been investigating the Public Utilities Commission, and I didn't start off with that intent. Um, my background is that I was an assistant counsel to the United States Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, where a lot of time was spent developing legislative records for the senators to make informed decisions about national problems. Uh, and then as the city attorney of San Diego, the elected city attorney, we had a uh, very vigorous uh, PUC uh, representation. Uh, what I'm going to say to you right now is going to be uh, in some ways probably startling, and I have brought along with me and I've provided electronically the evidence to support everything that I'm about ready to say. And I'll be brief because, but I do, uh, this is the most important change over the last 105 years. The Public Utilities Commission was created by the people uh, to do right, and I am so proud of uh, please forgive me, these young assembly members, uh, for what they're doing. It just brings, what it's, it, <laughs> yeah, all of you. Okay, now, the voters created the California Public Utilities Commission to keep rates just and reasonable. In 2016, the rates are neither Californians or amongst the least users of electricity, but pay amongst the highest rates. A review of 7,500 emails and writings show that Wall Street bankers have a stranglehold on CPUC decisions. And I have, by the way, uh, copies of my statement here to, to, to substantiate what I'm saying. Wall Street bankers pressured Governor Brown to appoint a Wall Street loyal investment banker to the CPUC back in January to March 2011, and that's confirmed in emails. We know from long experience that government by organized money, as President Roosevelt taught us, is just as dangerous as government by organized mob. Evidence also support inferences that some CPUC commissioners leak CPUC inside information to institutional investors and investment bank researchers while blocking public access to information the CPUC uses to impose higher rates. And again, those emails documenting that are included uh, in, in, our, in our papers, and we have more if you need um, them. Could the witness uh, try and sum up? You've already gone over three minutes. Okay. Um, shoot, I have a whole another page and a half. So uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll jump ahead to the, to the exciting end. W let, me, let me do it this way then. Let me, let me put this in context. The, the context today is that we're supposed to be transitioning, f in an energy transition from fossil fuels and nuclear to renewables. And what the CPUC is still doing is opposite of what the most advanced nations are doing, which is to, they're still fitting the supply to the demand uh, instead of the demand to the supply. That's what we really need to do. We need to, even in, in, uh, in ELISO, for example, they're saying let's keep ELISO open but the emails that we've retrieved from them show they're not even asking the customers to come back, uh, cut back on usage, nor are they even trying to measure how much usage they'd have to bring it down. Uh, I have my written statement in its entirety. Thank you. Uh, if, uh, if you can't get to sleep tonight, if you want to read this, I'd really appreciate it. We put a lot of time into it. Here are the two volumes that we put together to support what the statement says. And we have also provided electronically to your staff. And thank you very much for your courtesy for letting me go over. Next witness. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, Maria Severson, and I'm here to support this. Uh, Could you amendment. give us your uh, organization? Sure. Maria Severson, I'm a consumer advocate. I represent ratepayers. My law firm is Aguirre and Severson. Okay, and if you could talk in, they really, when you face us, we, it really doesn't get picked up by the microphone, so just talk into the microphone. Will do. Thank you. That is much better. <clears throat> Again, Maria Severson, Aguirre and Severson, I'm a ratepayers advocate and I'm here supporting the bill. To echo some of the comments of the chair, there, there has been deaths from San Bruno. There has been people moving out in Aliso. There have been entombed in the San Diego beaches 3.6 million pounds of nuclear waste with uh, no plan to move that anytime soon and no, no efforts to figure out how and when to do it or who's going to pay for it. Ratepayers in San Diego have been saddled with the lion's share of the failed plant when the evidence that's been revealed by uh, criminal investigators after documents were found in a search warrant revealed that there was a deal worked out long uh, before the public was aware uh, that the ratepayers were going to pay and not shareholders. Wall Street controls the utilities. The utilities should be able to make a profit, but not in secret and not at the expense of ratepayers. So we support this bill, I mean this amendment to the Constitution, uh, so that there is a way that the people can have a, feel there's a sense of integrity again in their systems. The, the CPUC was started for railroads, and now it, it's managing Uber. <laughs> you know, it's time that it is broken down, reset the clock, start anew, and let's figure out how to get the integrity uh, back in the institution. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other witnesses in support, name, uh, organization, and position. Thank you. My name is Mark Ruberger. I'm with the San Francisco Taxi Workers Alliance. Uh, we are in support. And I, may, I make a very brief statement. Very uh, brief. The, the California uh, State Auditor uh, issued a report in June of 2014 uh, roundly condemning the uh, CPUC's uh, uh, ability to protect the public in in the field of transportation, and I'm sure you're very aware of, uh, you know, their actions in in terms of uh, energy and uh, gas and electricity. But uh, it's just as bad uh, for transportation. Thanks. Thank you. Next witness, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, James Jack here on behalf of Caltel. Just wanted to make a, a very brief comment that we shared with the chair and committee uh, as it relates to telecom as this moves forward. Um, you know, we do, just did want to point out that federal law does um, delegate to state commissions um, specific roles and responsibilities with regard to telecom that preserve and promote competition. We think that's very important, and we just want to make sure that as this body continues to deliberate and this moves forward, that we keep that in mind as to what the uh, successor uh, might look like. Thank you. Thank you. Next witness. Hi, my name is Barry Korngold. I'm also with the San Francisco Taxi Workers Alliance, and I was part of the rulemaking proceeding on the on TNCs, the Uber and Lyft, from the beginning. And originally, they had defied a cease and desist order for two years, and it, because the CPUC could not enforce the law, instead they they made laws to conform to them and made them legal. They created a new category of transportation, which is basically taxi service that they can't regulate, they don't have anybody to enforce any regulations, and basically what happens now is the rest of the transportation industry has got to end up being deregulated because why would you pay for a license if all you have to do is download an app, just to sum it up. So um, they're not, I don't understand how they can regulate that and all these other utilities too. There needs to, I fully support this bill. It's Thank totally you necessary. Much. Uh, other witnesses in support? Any witnesses in opposition? Not in opposition, but since uh, there's no neutral. Um, good afternoon. My name is Mario Guerrero. I'm with the Service Employees International Union Local 1000. We do represent over 95,000 state workers throughout California. Um, 
We do. Among the, those that we represent, we also represent public utility regular, regulatory analysts, PURAs, at the CPUC. These folks carry out many of the agency's uh, mission-critical responsibilities uh, in regulation of electricity, water, telecommunications, natural gas pipelines and safety, um, consumer protection, transportation network companies, and rail safety. Um, our members are passionate about the mission of the CPUC and the work they do to keep our community safe. We don't have a position uh, on the bill today, however, we have a number of concerns. The first concern that we have is that this bill lacks specifics. The bill is extremely broad and leaves many unanswered questions while giving specific timelines to reassign unspecified functions of the CPUC. This bill does not outline if the CPUC staff will follow the reassigned uh, functions to other state agencies, departments, boards, or other entities. It uh, also does not outline whether the, what other entities it may create and what functions these entities will perform. Uh, the second concern is reassignment of unspecified functions of the CPUC uh, uh, may dilute the regulatory expertise of the staff at the CPUC. A third concern, uh, this bill does not address CPUC's neglected uh, human resources problems. For example, 85% of CPUC's uh, current workforce is new to their positions uh, within the past five years, suggesting that there is a need for workforce succession uh, planning. Additionally, large turnover rates indicate there are uh, compensation and cost of living issues that the CP CPUC must consider. Fourth, um, the bill does not directly address um, how to prevent the corruption uh, given previous problems at the CPUC. Our members share uh, the public's and the author's concerns uh, for the public safety. After all, our members live uh, in the communities they serve. Uh, we will continue to engage with the author's office, with uh, the CPUC, and with our members, and hopefully we can resolve some of our concerns. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next witness. Alex Rooker with Communication Workers of America, Local 9400, and not opposing uh, uh, Chairman Gatto, but also some concerns. Prior to the last, this current uh, chairman, we had no movability, nothing that would help, that I, in my opinion, uh, we represent workers and we represent consumers across the state in the telephone industry. The telephone industry got away with everything. If they were in support of something that was going to uh, neglect consumers, it passed. So what I've heard here today is also a problem that we've had here in this building for a long time. I see that now changing, and I'm hoping that it changes. The last commissioner would dictate who, what commissioner got what assignments, and he would dictate to the staff what went on in that building. The new chairman, I see him coming a little bit more in support of what the consumers want, but just know that the reason why so many of these things happen in the past, and I'm sure you know that, Assembly Member Gatto, is that the last chairman would say uh, he wouldn't let workers do the work and do their job and the job that they needed to do. So there's good people in that building that I have talked to and I've worked with, but we've never been able to get things through up until recently. So that is my concern, uh, hoping that the legislature really does see oversight and help consumers, the people we actually represent in this state. Thank you. Thank you. Any other witnesses? Support, opposition, in between, comment? All right. Uh, Mr. Gatto, perhaps you could uh, uh, answer in response to some of the uh, neutral witnesses. Sure, more than happy to. The... the um to, to address what the gentleman from SEIU mentioned, um, we are more than happy to clarify in this, if, if it's needed, that there will be no reduction in jobs um, with existing PUC workers. As a matter of fact, I can state with with no problem that it is the, um, I think he referred to them as puras, it's the, the public utility, it's the people tasked with safety. We want more of those. I mean, that, that's exactly what this bill wants, is, or this, this measure is about, is getting the PUC to focus on the things that are most dangerous, most detrimental, and doing those jobs very well. Uh, when it comes to telecom, as the the um, uh, the representative from CW, CWA indicated, uh, yes, we would hope that this would result in more specialized agencies that can deal with things like consumer complaints in a more specialized uh, manner. And then, in terms of it, you know, being um, being a little bit uh, a little bit uh, unspecific in areas. 
I want to state that we tried to keep the intention of this this ACA with keeping with what um, what is best and it is assumed as best practices when you go before the voters, and that is keeping it as simple and as clear as possible. I actually, uh, in consultation with my joint authors, wrote this myself, and we, we went over it several times to make sure that if an average voter got this, and there's going to be great turnout the election that this is supposed to go before it, if the average voter got this, they could read through it and understand exactly what we meant. So we're not hiding the ball. We're not doing anything like that. So they could understand it and hopefully vote for it. So, um, But I am more than happy to work with all the uh, the tweeners, and I think my joint authors are as well, to make sure that they feel completely comfortable because I think we're on the same page. All right. Uh, great. And then I'll have a comment also with regard to SEIU. Um, you can be assured that this legislature is going to be very concerned about the jobs, and as the chair said that the work gets done and as the chair said that's probably more people rather than less though of course we'd have to find the money for them too but we're not going to be cutting um in well we're going to set priorities and we're going to make sure things get done while the chair will not be here when this comes i plan to be many of us around this uh, horseshoe tent will as well and uh the governor as well, I think, will be quite concerned about the jobs. Putting that into the ACA might well make it a little – might give a shot to somebody who doesn't want to see this go forward. So uh, I will leave this to the chair, but I think that he is right that this has to be simple. Um, beyond that, we have had President Picker here, who I think many of us think is trying to change, but even he admits he's not having great luck. He's trying to change the PUC. He has admitted that they're, um, they have too many responsibilities. There are too many things they have to work on without adequate staff, and, for, and the pipelines being the most obvious. Um, I will next go to uh, other members for comments, Mr. Dolly and then Mr. Obernolte. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank you for adding me as a co-author on this bill. I have a, a lot of frustration with the PUC, as uh, I know most members do. But with saying that, the devil's in the details. And you know, we tried to deregulate uh, your power some time back before I was on in the legislature, and it failed miserably. And uh, so I am looking forward to working with you, both all of you who are engaged and the, the other authors, to make sure that uh, we do this in a way that um, actually really serves the public in the manner we're trying to move forward. So. Uh, just with that, I would move the bill. I don't think we have a motion. Second. I move the bill, and uh, I look forward to uh, uh, this process uh, serving the constituents. Uh, and it is long overdue, I will say that. I hear that a lot from my own uh, district. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. All right. Mr. Obernolte, then Mr. Hadley, then Mr. Williams. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Gott, I'd like to commend you and your co-authors for bringing this bill forward. I certainly share your frustration with the PUC, and I particularly like your approach to solving the problem because what you've done is turned this into a simple referendum on whether or not the legislature should be empowered to exercise oversight into the areas where the PUC has authority. Uh, I think that's a very momentous decision. It's obviously a, requires a constitutional amendment, which is a two-thirds vote, but I think that that vote level is appropriate for something this momentous. So should the voters uh, approve this and empower us to exercise this authority, then as Mr. Dolly said, the devil will be in the details. And I think it's going to require a lot of thought and discussion and research on all of our parts to decide what ways and we can best serve our constituents in reassigning that authority and exercising our legislative prerogative. Um, I'm a little bit concerned, though, because a two-thirds vote will be required to send this to the voters and modify the Constitution. I actually think that that's an appropriate level of uh, vote to be required to make these changes and reassign these duties from the PUC, because I think a broad level of agreement and cooperation is going to be necessary within the legislature to make this work. And so I wondered if you'd share your thoughts on that, because that could be simply accomplished in the uh, resolution that you've presented, you could put that vote threshold on the reassignment of those duties from the POC, PUC. Sure, and we, we talked about that. Um, you may rest assured that uh, my joint author to the left uh, raised that as well. And ultimately, we concluded that um, we don't want this to be one of those measures that could be attacked as silencing the majority 
um, you know, um, and, and I'm, I'm not saying this in reference to party. Um, I'm saying this in reference to some of the people will talk about this as they elected their representatives and it's silencing the majority in favor of um, a minority within uh, the legislature. But ultimately, we came down to the conclusion that uh, the legislature would have two years to do this. Uh, there is a very strong there are very strong differences even among the parties in the legislature. And I think even to get to uh, that crucial 41 vote threshold and to get through all the committees, uh, you will have to have substantial agreement uh, from all sides. And um, I, you know, I, I won't be here unless term limits gets repealed in the next six months. Uh, <laughs> but but I do think that um, it's been my experience that there's a lot of votes every year where, you know, you I mean, I have a vote right now before local government where all the Republicans are up on it and the Democrats are not. And uh, it's going to get out because there's a few people in the middle who are going that, that way. And um, and so I do think that all of the various bills that would come after this, it would it would be an ongoing constitutional convention for all of these issues for two years. And I think there's ample opportunity for the legislature to come together and there will be plenty of time and um, and ability for both parties to have input. OK, Thanks. thank you. Uh, I. I'm going to support the bill. Uh, I think it's it's a, a wonderful way of solving the problem. Uh, I still feel, though, that a two-thirds vote requirement would be prudent, and it has nothing to do with partisan politics and more to do with the fact that two-thirds is the threshold for issues that are truly momentous when uh, considered against the daily lives of our constituents, and these certainly qualify because very few things that this legislature do has the potential to impact our constituents' daily lives more than those kinds of decisions. But I want to thank you for bringing the bill forward. I'll certainly be supporting it. Thank you. Mr. Hadley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Chair, first I want to join my colleagues and really commend you for this. This is, we should not underestimate the significance of the opportunity here. This is a once in a generation, once in a multi-generational opportunity to, uh, to improve and modernize and increase oversight of the functions that the CPUC currently, currently undertakes. And I, and I say that in particular, given your short tenure as chair of this committee, to have seized the mantle on this and to make it happen, I, it's very commendable. Uh, and I also, uh, I take a lot of confidence in uh, the broad bipartisan uh, nature of the authorship of this bill. And uh, I share uh, several of Mr. Obernolte's concerns about the, the consensus that is needed uh, to implement changes as significant as the changes that we have here. Uh, and so I, I, I do share those concerns, but I also take confidence from the, the authorship here. And I hope this spirit can continue in, in these discussions. Assuming this measure is, is passed by the voters, we're going to need uh, – I think a very collegial uh, attitude to get this right uh, in future legislative sessions. Um, this is not a, a concern about the bill, but this is a plea to my colleagues on this committee and to our colleagues in the legislature. Uh, one of my biggest single concerns about the legislature as we currently conduct our business today is that oversight is the part of our job that we do least well. Uh, this legislature is very good at uh, authoring, deliberating, voting on over 2,000 bills a year, turning several hundred of them into new state laws. We're very bad at reviewing laws previously passed, and we're very bad at overseeing the executive branch and the state agencies that are responsible for implementing those laws and seeing, uh, seeing the, the, work, uh, the work in the real world, uh, not in the legislative world. And the uh, this constitutional change, if if consummated, would significantly increase the burden and the responsibility on the legislature to exercise our oversight responsibilities. And that is in part a schedule function. And I think future committee chairs need to make oversight a more significant function of the work of their committees. And it's in part a cultural uh, change in this legislature where all 120 of us uh, understand how central our oversight responsibilities, not just our bill writing responsibilities, are uh, uh, to the success of our work in the assembly. So I am uh, I'm supportive of this measure. If the opportunity exists, I would be proud to be added as a co-author. Uh, uh, but I uh, but I do share some of Mr. Obernolte's concerns, and I and I and I make a plea to all of us uh, to exercise our oversight responsibilities 
passed the passage of such an amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Then Mr. Williams, followed by Mr. Chavez, and then Ms. Burke.